Welcome to the Holy Smokes Podcast, a show about faith, friendship, fine tobacco and drink. I'm Steve Ryder in the Lion's Den in Monument, Colorado with my buddy Tobin Arthur. Tobin, thanks for being on my man. Steve, it's my pleasure. It's a lot of fun. So, first question, what you smoking? Well, this is a fantastic cigar so far. It's called Crossfire. And from what I understand, produced by a Holy Smokes member himself out of Florida. Yeah, Orlando Mark Kitts. Mark, thanks for the sticks. Yeah. I'm liking it so far. I'm just getting into it. You got the Maduro. I give you three options in yeah. total. Safari and then two Crossfires, the mm-hmm. Connecticut and the Maduro, and you chose the Maduro. Yeah. And we're pairing it with coffee, which I love to do. It goes back to my... You're a coffee snob if I've ever seen one. Yeah. It's... it's it knows no end, Steve. <laughs> it goes back to my college days, but when I was out of college, I had two roommates, and we were all three in the coffee industry. And if you get into coffee, no different than if you get into wine, and as I realized later, cigars, you know, these are all products from the earth. Once you learn how to taste one, the same kind of flavor notes and descriptions apply to the other. Yeah. So... Here we were, a bunch of mid-20s to our late 20s-something guys sitting around our house, and we would bring home two, three, four different kinds of coffee. We'd have two, three, four kinds of cigars, and we'd sit around and make French presses and compare the cigars and the coffee. It was was fantastic. So for those of us that are not, we just fire up a Keurig and make some coffee in the morning. Yeah. Or an espresso. I've got an espresso machine as well. Mm-hmm. What should we know about coffee that you can instill, before we get to your story, that you can mm-hmm. instill on the Holy Smokes listeners about how to make better coffee and what to be looking for? And... Yeah. So if I distilled that down, there's really two different types of coffee. you got espresso-based coffee, and then you have drip coffee, right? There's all kinds of ways to make both. Well, really only one way to make espresso through an espresso machine where you need high pressure. And so you're using a fine grind and high pressure, which is why, you you know, then you get just a little typically one to two ounces of coffee. Now you add all kinds of flavors and milks if you want, but the true coffee aficionado would just drink straight espresso. That's how you pick up the flavor. Notes. Which you do. I, when, when, whenever we get together, you, you, you get that little I do. Little cup. And it's funny. Um, so I started my career at Starbucks Coffee, which we can, you know, go through that later, but my boss was Howard Schultz, and Howard built a, a taste for espresso. And when he would go visit stores, that's how he would immediately determine if that store was making their coffee properly, was to have them pull a shot of espresso. And uh, it's really hard to, to mask bad espresso, unless you start adding milk and things. And then you're really not tasting the coffee anymore. You're tasting yeah. milk and syrups and so forth. So this, on the drip side, most people are familiar with you know, a French press or a coffee drip machine. There's also AeroPress. There's what's called a pour over a V60, but they're all doing the same thing. And that's just exposing grinds to water, typically for about four minutes, you're steeping it. So everything is a variation on that. It's either, you know, you're pushing the water up, you're pushing the water down, it doesn't really matter. So the answer to your question, uh, I was also very blessed. I lived in Seattle for 20 some years and belonged to a unbelievable cigar club that some of the members of Holy Smokes may know of called Vertigo Club. And it was a private cigar club. Was? No longer around? <clears throat> no, it's still there. Okay. Was from my perspective, because okay. I'm no longer there. Yeah. Great, great group of guys. And, you know, like everything with cigars, it's really the same with coffee. The cigars and the coffee, in my opinion, are just the excuse to get together. It's really all about community and hanging out. Yeah. And that's what we talked about at Starbucks was it was about the third place. Your first place was home. Your second place was work. But we all need a third place to gather and hang out. And you've seen how coffee shops all over the country have become just that. People working and hanging out and having meetings all throughout the day. But in any event, one of the members of Vertigo Club was a physician and had a heart attack at one point. And when he recovered from the heart attack... He had this epiphany that he said to everybody, life's too short to drink the crappy wine, smoke the bad cigars, and drink the bad coffee. Like, what are we waiting for? 
you know, he had been storing up these fine wines, thinking someday I'll drink the fine wines. He's like, someday may never come. Yeah. It might be tomorrow is my, my last day. So we've always had the perspective that as long as you're going to drink coffee, drink good coffee, because it's not that much harder to make good coffee versus a Keurig or an espresso. And there's nothing wrong with those, particularly in a pinch. But <clears throat> when you're getting pods, you got to realize those have been ground up, packaged, sealed, and they've been sitting there for weeks, months, sometimes even years. And coffee, just like wine, just like cigars, is a living, breathing product. And the minute it gets cut from the earth, it starts losing those nutrients, it's it's dying, it's drying. And so, you know, there's something to be said for getting it fresh once it's roasted specifically, right? You can have green coffee that sits and, and it won't deprecate quite as quickly. So having a grinder at home, Having a source of hot water, it's really all you need to make really good coffee. And the temperature is important from what you... Yeah, you want it hot enough to extract the oils, because that's really what you're... You know, it's, it's like with meats. You're, you're really... The fats are what bring out the taste in meats when you're barbecuing. The same with coffee is the oils are what bring out all the flavor. And so you want coffee that's got enough oils to have a good flavor profile. And so coffee, the water needs to be probably 195 to 205 is the right range to extract the right uh, amount of oils. And as we saw here in, you know, in Colorado, if you try to heat coffee to 212, it boil, it's, it's, you know, already boiling boils. over. Yeah. So two, 200 is a good, good temperature. Um, so I don't store coffee for more than a couple of weeks. I keep it out of the light. I keep it airtight. And, uh, and I try to, you know, even drink it more quickly than a couple of weeks. When I'm buying it in the store, I look at the date when it was roasted. I'm typically not going to buy it if it's roasted more than a month beforehand. And then all the other factors are pretty simple. So temperature, uh, and then you want to scale, just any simple kitchen scale, because you want to get the the ratio of water to coffee right. And then lastly, you want... And what is that ratio? It depends, but you're looking usually at 18 to 1. So if I'm uh, brewing a single cup of coffee in a French press, like we did today, I would put about 20 grams of coffee in the French press. Then I would tear that out, zero it out, the scale that is. And then I would put just over 300 grams of water, so 325, but you can play around with that. Some coffees are going to taste better at a 15 to 1. Some are going to be better at a 21. So no real magic. It's it's part of the experimentation. And then the last thing is grind. So you got to have a grinder. And the better the grinder, the better. I mean, a lot of people just have a blade grinder. It's a $20. And that's fine for the most part, but you're going to get a lot of, if you look at those grinds, you throw them on the counter, you're going to get a lot of variability, some big heavy pebbles and some really fine. And it's okay. It's not the end of the world, but a really, really good grinder is going to give you a really consistent, uh, grinds. And so for a French press, it's going to be quite coarse because they're just sitting that coffee is just floating in the water for four minutes. So you want a coarse grind. And then for a pour over, it's a little bit finer because gravity is is running through, right, from water's running down through the yeah. coffee, so you need that to sit there a little bit longer to prevent the gravity from pulling it through too fast or you won't get enough extraction. So you got one where the water's just, the coffee's just sitting in the water. You got one where the water's coming down because of gravity. And then, like I said, an espresso, you're pushing the water down so you have really fine because you're forcing it through mm-hmm. faster than gravity. So coarse, medium, and fine. <laughs> any other tips for for holy smokers to <clears throat> you know these days coffee? every city every state's not every city in every state but most states have pretty good roasters so getting roasters from your local state's always nice because it's going to be even know, fresher fresher but all that said there are some great ones if you're doing order by mail and my personal taste is that george howell out of boston's the best in the country hmm. Uh, He sold his company, originally Coffee Connection, to Starbucks Coffee along the way when I worked at Starbucks, and he became quite wealthy, and then he retired, and then came back into the business as a wealthy guy, and decided he was going to do high-end coffee right, and so he will go find the very best coffees in the world, and he's got the relationships to get those, because those are, it's very difficult, and once he finds a really good coffee, it's just like wine, a good coffee this year from a particular farmer may not be great next year depending on weather and all these other factors so if he finds a really terrific coffee he cryo freezes a portion of that lot so he's only going to allocate this year a certain amount 
and then he will unveil some more next year and the following year. So you know if you get great coffee from him, you may get that again next year and the following year, but it's in very limited quantities, so it's expensive. <laughs> 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 but George Howell's the man. And then I would say the other market after uh, George to follow are the coffee makers out of uh, Oregon. Really? Yeah, some of the Oregon. best in the country. Yeah, Portland, Oregon, and like the coffee snobs of coffee snobs. Interesting. Yeah, if you've ever seen the show Portlandia, yeah, there's some great episodes just making funny of fun of the the coffee snobbery there. It's unparalleled. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's one where actually J Jerry Seinfeld goes to uh, <clears throat> Portland from in his show. Uh, comedians in cars drinking coffee or uh, whatever it is, yeah. drink coffee. So he's there re meeting with Fred Armisen because Fred's recording Portlandia. So he goes to meet Fred there and they do a whole episode in Portland. That's a must watch. Go watch that episode and watch what he does with the countdown timer at the coffee bars. And he, and he talks about the ratio of the longer you wait, the better the coffee must be. And the more expensive the coffee, of course, the better it must be. But it's a very absurd, like, you know, waiting, waiting for drip coffee for 10 minutes. It's a skit that only Fred and Jerry Seinfeld could pull off. That's awesome. So before you went to Seattle, you were a Colorado kid. I was. Grew up in Colorado. And then I went to school in Los Angeles, stayed there for 10 years in that area. And then Starbucks pulled me to Seattle, where I stayed for about 20 years. Came back to Colorado in 2018, where I still so have a huge family. So, but growing up here in Colorado, big family, you said? Eight kids. I'm the oldest of eight. Number one of eight. Yeah. What was that like? What did your parents do? My mom was a full-time manager of the eight, and my dad was in the insurance business, and then the investment business. And um, people would always ask my mom, oh, you must be Catholic or Mormon. We actually did grow up Catholic. She got tired of answering the question. She'd say, no, I'm just horny. <laughs> and as you can imagine, for a teenager to hear their mom saying they're horny, it's just horrifying. Because as far as yeah. I'm concerned, even to this day, I was still hatched. You're, you're <laughs> I'm, I come from an egg. I, I don't want to think of my, my parents, you know, getting it on. No, no, no I don't think any male. <laughs> <laughs> most kids, uh, not even just males, most kids don't want to. I, I always joke my parents had sex only three times. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was fun. And when we moved back, you know, my kids, I have three kids, had just a, an army of cousins. And so it's a lot of fun for them. That's awesome. So what kind of kid were you growing up? I was a good student, but my main thing was sports. Uh, I was, you know, sports, 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 all the way through high school. And where in the state did you grow up? Grew up in the uh, Inglewood area, okay. a little area called Cherry Hills. So Denver, for those that don't know, it's the Denver area, Denver yeah. Metro. Yeah, the south part of Denver. And I went to a an all-boys Catholic school, which is no longer all-boys, but called Mullen High School. Our, or a football powerhouse, or at least football have been powerhouse. For a yeah, long it really time. started at that time, and we were really we became powerhouse in, in just about everything. And I was really fortunate. My best friend, he and I were avid baseball players, and his brother was a year older than us. And the three of us and our collective friends were some of the better players in town. And it's all we did was play baseball. And he was he was from you know a family of means. And so he had uh, a batting cage in his house when that was back when that just didn't exist. And so we would go to his house and hit every day on the weekends, you know, when all the other boys were out chasing girls and doing all that kind of stuff. We would go and hit the gym and we would bat and then we'd watch movies all weekend. And if, so if we weren't playing games, we were working out and, play, and batting. And so we were good. And the brother decided he was going to go to Mullen instead of Cherry Creek, which is the big public school, which is a huge national sports powerhouse. And at the time they had had a run in every sport. My sports were tennis and baseball. They had won the tennis championship. Uh, Cherry Creek did or Mullen? Cherry Creek for okay. decades, like never, never yeah. missed a beat. You know, it's a student body of 4,000 kids. They, so they had a big pull, but they were also constantly pulling exchange students from Europe. So, no, you know, big surprise, you get these Swedish kids who just all <laughs> happen to come to Cherry Creek. And 
play tennis for them and baseball. So we went there with a little bit of chip on our shoulder, like we're going to go beat Cherry Creek in all of our sports. And we did all four years. We beat them in everything. And it was a lot of fun. So yeah, baseball, that was what I did growing up was baseball and, and tennis. And then, and what positions? Uh, I was a center fielder primarily. And we had an incredible team. When we won the state championship my junior year, we were one of the top teams in the country. And several of those of our teammates went straight to the pros. Wow. Yeah. And had any, great careers. Any names? Yeah. So the, the most notable names are Mark Holzmer and Clint Savaris. And they also ironically own the largest baseball training program in Colorado now. So after their pro careers and they were moving around the country, they formed a group called Slammers, which is a powerhouse nationally um, for, you know, youth through high school Mm -hmm. travel teams. And back when we were growing up, that whole idea of kind of travel baseball didn't exist like it does today. Really all these travel sports, right? We had tournaments, but when you played tournaments, you would play local local tournaments and you'd play, you know, one game a day. Or if you went to a travel tournament and we did go to travel tournaments, but you would play a game a day. It was rare to have a double header. Nowadays, and that was at the high school level, not the youth level. Youth level you certainly weren't traveling. Nowadays the youth, my kids, they're playing, you know, tennis tournaments, baseball tournaments, golf tournaments all over the country, you know, during those heavy seasons, and they'll play three games in a day. Um, so the whole, all these sports at the youth level have changed. And of course they become an enormous industry financially. So these guys, um, you know, have benefited from that. There's this whole travel industry, travel baseball industry, and, and their group has become, like I said, one of the preeminent names in the country. Now Colorado's in, in these, you know, Midwest uh, states are typically not the powerhouses in these sports. The powerhouses are obviously from the California, sunshine states. Yeah, Texas, Florida, Florida, Georgia, just because they're playing year round. Um, but it turns out that Colorado is a hotbed for pitchers, primarily because they aren't throwing their arms out like those other states, because the kids aren't throwing as many pitches throughout the year. You're really? in California, you're throwing all year long. Your arm really never has a rest. Baseball is getting a little more conscientious about that as these kids, like literally 12, 13, 14 year old kids are having Tommy John surgery these days. It's crazy. Totally nuts. You never used to see any of that until maybe high school, but usually not even until college and and early pros. And and I work with a lot of uh, surgeons, orthopedic surgeons in particular. And that's the thing they all share with me. The biggest trend, one of the biggest trends in sports has been this Rise in specialization, so kids sticking to one sport. Which is not good. Not good for them. No, it's not. I I, I remember watching a video of J.J. Watt talking about Mm. how important it was for him, once football season was over, for him to focus on basketball. Mm. And then once that was over, for him to focus, I think it was baseball. I mean, he's a three-sport athlete in Pewaukee, Mm. which is a suburb of Milwaukee. And and I think all the Watt brothers... Were, were three sport athletes or four sport athletes. Jimmy Andrews, who's considered one of the godfathers of modern sports medicine and Tommy John surgery, etc. He told me a number of years ago, we we're talking about this very topic, and he used the example of Jordan Spieth versus Tiger Woods. And he said when Jordan was growing up, I believe in Texas, his parents wouldn't let him play golf year round. They forced him to play basketball. Or, you know, any other sport, but basketball was his other sport. And so he said, as a result, Jordan's body will last as long as he wants it to in golf, whereas Tiger's broke down much earlier. Now Tiger's a beast. He's a unicorn where he's been able to recover from all these spine surgeries and still play at a competitive level, which is just crazy. Most people would have been long out of professional sport after what he's been through. But nonetheless, his body did break down early because his dad had him playing golf only from... Yeah. Whatever, six, eight years old on. So specialization, what else? Uh, specialization, and if you look at pitching in particular, and it's funny, I was watching the All-Stars, I think it was two years ago, and you know they do this neat thing with the Little League World Series, which is typically in August, and they organize nowadays, they have two of the pro teams are playing a game in the area, so those pros go and hang out with the Little Leaguers. So this... A couple of years ago, it happened to be the Angels and somebody else. And the Angels GM, they were interviewing me. He said, you know, if we renamed baseball, it really should be called pitching. 
He says, because really the game is about pitching. Everything else is just sort of... I never thought about it that way, having played baseball my whole life. And I'm like, you know what? You're right. It yeah. really revolves around the it pitcher. Starts, it starts with the pitcher. Starts and ends with the pitcher for the most part. And, and so as you look at pitching over the years, that's changed significantly to, the, to where pitchers are now throwing. You know, if you're not throwing in the 90s, you're not even considered for D1 college, let alone pros. And in the pros, you know, it's not uncommon for these guys to consistently be at the mid-90s and, or, you know, 101, 102, 103. So there's a lot of stress on those arms, and the arm's not designed for that movement. And you see that pressure all the way down to the youth leagues now where radar guns are available for, frankly, most dads. And so they're out there radar gunning their 10-year-old kid and hoping he's hitting 50 and then 60 and then 70. And uh, so they're, they're, while they're on the one hand is a lot more attention to health, at the end of the day, the arm's not designed for that movement. And as it's putting that stress on at those early ages... And then, no surprise, if you've got a 12-year-old kid who's got a, you know, really solid arm, what do the coaches want to do? Well, they all want to win, so they're going to pitch that kid till he's blue in the face. And uh, so, thus, you see the Tommy John surgeries at 12, 13, 14 years old, which is crazy. And, and it's the same in other sports, right? You see this in gymnastics. You see it in dance. And I know those sports just through the lens of my nieces. I have four nieces who are all really into those particular sports and these girls. Uh, I have a, one niece who's a very, very talented dancer, and they'll dance 8 to 10 hours a day. That's not good. That's a day. That's not good for your Pro body. athletes don't do that in any sport. Half that. Yeah. This is 15-year-old girl, 16 year, olds now, 16 year olds now. You know, they're in their growth spurts. They got all this, you know, the body's changing, and they're stressing it at 8 to 10 hours a day. So big surprise that there's a lot of injuries. <laughs> so after high school... What'd you do? Where'd you go? I ended up at USC, Los Angeles. Why? It's a longer story, but the shorter story is I started off at a small Christian school in Santa Barbara called Westmont, which is an awesome school. Why'd you go to Southern California? Uh, I wanted to get back to sports. So we, I had spent five years in my youth. There was a little interim period there, five years, where we were in Fresno, California, which okay. is the armpit of the world. <laughs> but I loved it because the sports were fantastic and the weather was great. So I knew I wanted to get back to California. And, you know, you're just playing a different level of sport. And I thought I was going to go out there and play uh, baseball and or tennis. Turned out to play neither. I got distracted in business. I should mention as I was growing up, I had a real knack and interest in business. I was reading the Wall Street Journal when I was 14 years old. Really? Yeah. And um, What spurred that? I uh, just always had an interest in finance and money and business, and I don't know what really spurred that. Probably my dad inspired me in, in, in one form or another, but it didn't push me. It was just naturally inclined there. And so when I went to USC, I, well, I should say when I was at Westmont for that first year, my roommate and I decided to buy our first business, and we got a business broker, and we were in the middle of buying a bar, and it got down to the closing of purchasing this bar. Nobody had bothered to ask our age to that point, but then as we were filling out documentation and bank loans and things, we had to pull out the driver's licenses, and somebody said, wait a minute, you guys aren't 21 years old. I said, yeah, why is that a problem? Well, you, you can't own a bar if you're not 21 years old. You, you know, it's, it's, it's a law. We're not serving the liquor. We just own the business. That doesn't work that way. And <laughs> um, So that, that deal fell through. But that's the direction we went. I had a roommate who I grew up with. He'd gone to high school with me and went with me to college. And, you know, for those familiar with Santa Barbara, it's a different world. I mean, this is the wealthy of yes. the wealthy. And yeah. this Westmont campus is, was rated the number two most beautiful campus in the United States at that point. And it's amongst all these, you know, they're not just mansions. They're, they're estates. And Oprah Winfrey was in the area later and on, on, and on, and on. So my roommate was a real outgoing guy, a real funny guy, and he went into investment banking. But he got us into the, to the habit of jumping fences, jumping these estate fences, and knocking on the door of the owners and just asking, what do you do? How did you accomplish this? <laughs> they didn't sick their dogs after oh, you? Oh, yeah. Dogs came after us. Security guards came after us. Police were called. But every once in a while, you'd get the, uh, come on in. Let's chat. And... <laughs> It was it was quite an experience. Oh so damn awesome! Yeah, I would have never done this on my own. It was uh, <laughs> he, he was a, he was an interesting influence, 
And so I ended up down at USC. They had um, one of the only two entrepreneur programs in the United States at the time. Babson oh, really? was the other one. Babson was considered kind of the entrepreneur program. And where's Babson? Babson's in Boston. Okay. It's not as well known now, but back then it was known for the entrepreneurial program. And nowadays, every school's got an entrepreneur program, right? They're everywhere. But back then, it's, it's funny to, to even say it. This is 30 years ago. There's only two. And I got in only because you had to be a business major, which I was not. I was an English major. <clears throat> I was thinking I was going to go to law school, get a law degree, but I was really going to be going to yeah. business. And the only reason I got in was that the head of the program was a business owner from Colorado. And he was very passionate about USC's entrepreneur program. So he commuted out to L.A. every week to teach this course. So I went to meet with him after they had told me I couldn't be in it because I wasn't a business major. And I said, this is the entrepreneur program. It's an entrepreneurship about figuring out better ways of doing things and bending the rules to make it work. And he said, yeah, you've got a good point. Uh, we'll give you a shot. And I said, if I'm not one of your top students at the end of the semester, boot me out. Needless to say, it, it went well, and I stayed in the program. So that's how I ended up in L.A., thrived in L.A. I was very blessed. I ended up working for Ronald Reagan through those last couple of years of college. And one of your coworkers used to be? I had a bunch of, of colleagues, one of which was Kevin McCarthy, who was the former Speaker of the House. Former Speaker of the House. And Kevin was working, f uh, he was from Bakersfield, and he worked for what was then the House Ways and Means Chairman, Bill Thomas, who's considered one of the most powerful, if not the most powerful, Ways and Means Chairman in history. Really? How yeah. so? Why? Um, he just was a political machine. He just had stacked power over the years and could get anything through Congress that he wanted to. Really? Yeah. It's, you know, so there are these guys from time to time. Tip O'Neill was another one that people hear about and they just are juggernauts. You know, they're not a bunch of hacks. And this guy was a political animal. I mean, he was a chess player. Newt Gingrich was another one yeah. you know, for sure. And so Kevin went up through the ranks. He was on staff for Bill Thomas through college and stayed on after college. And then he went in, ran for office in California, quickly rose up through the ranks in California, ended up getting that seat in Bakersfield once Thomas resigned. I mean, he basically just yeah. handed the keys to Kevin. And, you know, very quickly, at a very young age, became the, the House Majority Leader. I can't remember. He was in his late 40s, and that's pretty unheard of yeah. to be in a position of that authority. Just stepped down uh, at the end of this last year. So we had guys like that, some really interesting characters. My roommate went on and worked in Congress. He was the chief of staff for House Committee on Administration, which is responsible for campus or security. So these were the guys in, you know, on January 6th that were front and center. He wasn't at that point. He was... Uh, with the government printing office, GPO. He's the general counsel there. So some of these guys had gone on and spent their whole careers in Washington. It was a fun era, fun time. So did you ever end up buying a business with your roommate? Hmm. When, it went, when that bar deal fell through? We then started a, we ended up starting a window washing business. And we had a bunch of friends working for us, and we had these crappy cars, and we'd stick our ladders on these roofs of the cars and strap them down with bungee cords. I mean, this was like, you know, Sanford and Sons rolling through Santa Barbara, like these just clowns. And I remember our first job was this beautiful home up in the, in the hills, and it was a French guy. And, you know, he had this broken English, and uh, we, you know, gave him a bid, and we were washing the house. We got done with the windows and we went to collect and he says, no, no, no. The insides are not done. Well, we hadn't bid to do the insides. We're like, are you kidding? We did. Well, it's going to cost double. No, no, no. You gave me a price. So we honored the price. The bonus for us was, again, here we're, you know, 20 ish years old and he had a, a handful of gals our age and these being European girls were sitting out at his pool topless <laughs> all day. And so, we, we ended up spending a lot of time washing the windows right in front of the pool. And uh, it was a very inefficient job at the end of the day, except for the bonus scenery. And uh, yeah, that was not a great money maker. But, we, we, but you learned quick. We learned quick. We learned a few things. And then my friend TJ, who we grew up with here, um, ended up doing the business down in, in, back in L.A. He went to UCLA when I transferred to USC. And uh, he, he continued to do that, and he had, a, he had an interesting 
career at UCLA. So we were we became rivals. But anyway, it all started with the window washing, and uh, we'd never bought a business at that point. <laughs> So once you're done at USC, where'd you go? And how'd you end up at Starbucks? Mm. So I was a paralegal for a large law firm in college. Again, thinking I was going to go to law school. I went to work for uh, a very large firm that had partners that went to the law schools that I was interested in. And it was a great job. I stayed there for three years. There was a consistent theme. Every one of these attorneys kept bringing me into their office saying, don't do this. My job sucks. I hate my life. Every one of them. And, you know, these were powerful attorneys. One of them went on to become Secretary of State. Wow. One of them was the mayor of, of L.A. I mean, these were big-time people. Very, very powerful firm. But we were doing work for Starbucks Coffee. They were getting ready to expand outside of Seattle. They are getting ready to go public. And I got to interact with them. And I had an idea for a chain of coffee stores. Again, I was interested in coffee. And I thought, I'm going to start a chain of these. This is going to be a hot business. And I shared this with them. They said, why don't you come work for us? Go through our management program and learn the business on our dime and then go do your own thing if you want to do it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Which was very cool. I mean, in a way, that's cool that they did that on their dime in that you learn the business, but they also probably hadn't, would have some time with you to see if you were the kind of person that they'd want to try and incentivize. No, no, stay here. We'll, well, we'll, we'll, we'll give you a whole lot of extra bonuses yeah. and stock and whatever else. Uh, they got exactly what they wanted, which was I stayed 10 years, right? <laughs> so I thought I was going to go do a year. And 10 years into it, you know, I was thinking to myself, now we're kind of at the dot-com boom. My skill was technology, software development, network development. I thought, what am I doing? I'm making these guys millions of dollars. I got to go do my own thing. So what year did you start with Starbucks? 92. Okay. Yeah. That was long before I ever heard of Starbucks. I mean, it was still only in Seattle at the time, right? It was ju- had just come to LA. So I helped open up the LA market. And by the time I left, we had 200 stores there in LA. And by the time I left Starbucks, we had almost 10,000. <sighs> Yeah, so it was a meteoric growth. It was a lot of fun. That's why I stayed, right? I mean, yeah. we were just having so much fun rewriting the, the playbook on retail. How so? You know, a lot of things that we take for granted now didn't exist back then, or not at the, the, the level that they do now. As an example, Starbucks refused for a long time to do drive throughs They didn't think that was consistent with their brand. And we were so busy at our store in L.A. that I went out and bought headsets from Radio Shack and I went and got a cash register, an extra cash register at Costco. And I got a restaurant, a rolling restaurant table at the restaurant supply shop. And we started putting an extra station out on the sidewalk in the morning for drip coffee and muffins, like our top products. So people could just pull up to the curb, get their drip coffee and their blueberry muffin and roll. Because the lines, you know, and people don't even realize now, but the lines back then were out the door and around the block. This was everywhere. And people would think nothing of it to be 30 deep in line. I mean, nowadays, if people are five deep, they're going crazy, right? So we did that until our competitor across the street called the health department on us, and they shut us down temporarily. But the headquarters started realizing, we got to do something about the volumes in these stores. And this, this little, you know pop-up drive through worked really well. We were cranking it. And so eventually they got into the drive through business. And then we, we knew that people loved these coffee milkshakes. There was a company in LA called the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf, had this amazing blended drink called Ice Blended. Again, Starbucks refused to do that. You know, originally Howard was very much a purist. You only are in the espresso business and the drip business. And they, in fact, he wouldn't even carry nonfat milk. Said, nope, we don't make nonfat drinks. But they suck. We're not using blue water. We're using real milk. But the customers wanted nonfat. And so eventually broke down and, and went to nonfat. Same was true of coffee milkshakes. And so our store and the store, another store in Santa Monica, we both started bringing blenders in the back of our stores and playing around with essentially mochas, right? Blending those up trying to copy what these guys were doing at the shop. And so eventually the headquarters sent down a food team and started studying this. And, and we went into the Frappuccino business. And again, they were... blew up. 
blew up 10% of sales within a year and the margins are off the charts because it's yeah. mostly ice. And so, so that's, you know, they, we were just evolving like that, right? And being in the middle of, of a company kind of shaping the industry like that was, was a lot of fun. We were on the cover of magazines constantly and, and the, you know, of course the stock was, was going crazy. And so we were making some money. Um, so it was a lot of fun. And so that pulled me to Seattle. And I thought, I'll do that for a little while, then I'll jump over to Microsoft and go work there. And never ended up doing that. I ended up going out on my own first. So, But that's what took me to Seattle and was anchored there for 20 years. Tell me about Howard. What's Howard like? Because I'm, yeah. I'm fascinated with him. When, when he yeah. ran for president as an mm-hmm. independent four years ago, mm-hmm. I was really intrigued because I've, I've been very disenfranchised with the whole two-party system and the way in which they'll leverage. Yeah. They, they won't do anything specifically. Like Republicans won't do anything to really shrink the size of government, but when they're not in power, they'll talk about the size of government's too big. Yeah. and spending and you know they have the house the senate and the presidency and they don't do anything to defund planned parenthood which is a big giant talking point for them yeah um and likewise it's the same thing with the democrats when they're f- fully in power they're not doing anything to advance their their agenda yeah like it, enshrining abortion into federal law or same-sex marriage into federal law they're they're just waiting for that stuff to be overturned so that way they've got their talking points and raise money from their donors right and so I was really intrigued. I remember reading his book that, that he wrote in, in anticipation for him running for president. And I was fascinated because he was pretty moderate yeah. Democrat, but seemed like a moderate Democrat, like an old Kennedy Democrat. No, you're 100 percent on point. So that was his appeal was he was very much a middle of the road Democrat, really in the in the spirit of Tip O'Neill and, and then later Bill Bradley. In fact, Bill Bradley and he are good friends. Yeah. And so you saw a lot of that similarity. You know, these were kind of said another way, a little bit more socially liberal and fiscally conservative guys, right? Blue dog Democrats, they used to call them. And by the way, just on that last point, then I'll come back to Howard. It's a really interesting one. So, you know, as I mentioned, my roommate and lots of my other friends ended up back in Washington, D.C. and spent their whole careers there. And what you learn when you watch them, watch, you know, when I watch their careers evolve, they all go back well-intended and they have some ideological, you know, leaning. But the fact of the matter is they're career bureaucrats. They become pure career bureaucrats immediately. And what that means is they don't really want to work that hard. And I remember when the Republicans were out of power, and so a lot of my friends, you know, worked in the Republican side of the aisle, and I'd say, oh, it must stink, you know, when you got, they said, no, it's actually better when you're out of power because no one needs you to do anything. You don't run any committees. We're out playing golf all day. We got to come in as the minority, you know, voices on the committees, but we don't have to do anything. We don't have to draft any legislation because no one can't do anything with it. So they do nothing. They love it. And what you also see as an adjunct to that is the politicians don't run Congress. It, it means nothing what they think. The staff run Congress. They run Washington, D.C. And you hear Trump talk about this a lot, right? These people are protected. You cannot fire these government employees. And if you look at some of the fastest growing real estate over the last 20 years, it's been in the Washington, D.C. area, you know, Virginia, et cetera. And it's because of the staff. The staff have ballooned, and they're the ones writing the legislation. So when they joke that, you know, the bill was so large, I don't know what's in it, That's actually true because they're not writing the bill. The staff are writing the bill. They're giving it to the congressman or the senator. You know, the good ones are being diligent and going through it and and have some more input. But those are the guys. The exception, not the the rule. Yeah, the exception, not the rule. So the ideological bent really becomes meaningless because it's the bent of of the staffers. And they have an incentive not to rock the boat against the other guys too because those other guys are you know they will be in power at some point so they don't want to piss them off because they're all out playing golf together so it's a racket for sure and a very tough one to beat which is why trump by the way is so hated because he is not part of that racket he doesn't give a crap and he will call you know spade a spade or whatever the the phrase du jour is and that 
is a threat to that permanent class in Washington, Democrat or Republican, doesn't matter. But to the independent issue, it's just statistically impossible for a third party legitimately to do anything, you know, just the way the system is structured. And you saw that with Ross Perot, who's the guy that made the biggest dent in that, but he's also responsible for putting Bill Clinton in office, right? Bill Clinton would never have been in office without Ross Perot. I think Ross Perot, if I recall correctly, garnered 12% of the vote, but that was 12% that... Most of them would have gone to yeah, would have gone H.W. To Bush. Exactly. So um, Howard was an interesting guy. He's a, uh, like a lot of visionaries. He's, he's a unicorn in this sense. In my experience over the decades in business, there are entrepreneurs and visionaries who are most are, are suited for a particular stage of their company. They've got the vision. They launch the business. They're probably not the same skills that are needed as the business grows call it, you know, stage two. And so it's, it's often beneficial to transition that business to professional managers. Very rarely does that visionary evolve with the business such that they can lead it all the way. The two exceptions that I've personally witnessed were Howard. He, he changed, right? Howard grew over the years and became a guy that could run a small business into a guy that could run a multinational, you know, an international corporation skillfully. And so he's very smart, very adaptable. He's very focused and driven in some ways. Uh, he's very detail-oriented. I remember, you know, when you're getting ready in the retail business, which this was kind of restaurant retail, so we would have big holiday plans because you'd make so much money in the fourth quarter. And so all that buying is done in the, you know, in the summertime. You've got the product starting to come in. And so we would do these reviews where all those products were lined up and how we would come through and review them. And he essentially had the final say on everything. He'd say, that's the wrong color green. Get rid of it. That's the wrong font. I want the font two points lower. I mean, it was just extremely wow. detailed. I'm wow. thinking, you're the CEO of a, you know, at this point, multi-thousand unit chain. And he's focusing on the font and the color and the this and that because he had the vision for what that brand should be. And... Later, he, you know, he, he never lost that visionary element, but he always wanted to go out and acquire companies. And he was just always, you know, all hmm. over the board and to the point where the, the board of directors eventually put a discipline in place. And I can't remember, there was like eight points that they said any prospective acquisition Howard wanted to make had to meet these eight requirements. <laughs> and I remember I was in his, his assistant's office one time when he called in from New York and he says, I'm in this cinnamon roll shop or whatever a bakery and they've got the best cinnamon rolls i've ever had let's buy this company put an offer out to buy this let's get it ready you know kind of a thing it didn't fit within those eight points she said now howard does it meet that 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 no i'll see you when i get back to seattle <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was the end of that but he you know he did evolve and and um uh, as you know probably know he came back into the company twice not just once but twice to step back in as the CEO uh, from the guys who were kind of brought in to be the manager, the manager, managing CEO. Yeah. Yeah. So he was a, I learned a lot from him and his philosophies and, you know, my direct interactions with him were, uh, were, were always a learning experience. What kind of guy is he? Tough. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He's a tough guy. Um, smart. How so? How tough? I'll give you one example. This was a crazy story, but back in, you know, it's roughly two or 1996 ish. You know, we didn't have bi-directional connection to the stores like you would now with, you know, with um, connectivity. And so many people might not even remember what modems were, but every night the stores would dial into headquarters and upload their sales figures. And we would in turn, download any new information around prices or new products and so it was a two-way exchange and it would happen during all throughout the night and the cash registers in the stores were essentially ibm computers and we got to the point after years of updating you know a new blueberry muffin price and a new chocolate banana this and so on and so forth that these hard drives started getting full because we had never cleaned out the old data. So we wrote a script 
to go out and clean up all the stuff that wasn't being used and, and open up information on the hard, or room on the hard drives. Well, it wasn't very well tested. And so what happened was oh, geez. those files, um, I was home and I was the head of our 24 hour help desk at that point. And I remember getting paged at one thirty in the morning, which is never good. Nothing good is being told to you at one thirty in the morning. And it was the help desk saying, we got a problem. The stores on the East coast were starting to open and they said they're hard down. They have no computers. Like, what does that mean? We don't know. And we had a board that would show the calls coming in. I said, you know, how many do we have? They said, the, the queue is lighting up. It's, it's every store. So I'm immediately awake, and I'm starting to kind of sweat bullets thinking, what could this be? I said, do some forensics. Call me back in 15 minutes and give me an update. And now I'm starting to get dressed, thinking I'm, I'm going in. And sure enough, when they called back in 15 minutes, it was getting worse. And so what happened, it was as these stores were pulling from the East Coast to the West Coast, every time that store would call in, it would wipe out the hard drive. And so the store managers were coming into the stores, and when they flipped on the computers, they had nothing. It was just blank. And so I had to call Howard in the middle of the night and wake him up and tell him that we had this problem and we didn't know what it was. And he said, get everybody in. Like, what do you mean by everybody? I mean everybody. So all the vice presidents, everybody are rolling into Starbucks headquarters. This is now like 3.30 in the morning. Pajamas, sweats, the whole thing. And I'm, I'm already there. So I'm there. Howard's making a beeline for me because the help desk was the center of this command. And he says, where is everybody? I said, downstairs. He says, line them up. So I had the four vice presidents of the technology department and, you know, a handful of directors and others, and literally, like, lined up along a wall, wall like a firing squad. I mean, these are adults, senior executives. It's a, like a, it's a firing squad. Like, if, not, if there had been a gun in the room, it might have been dangerous. And Howard lights into him. I mean, lights into him. He says, I want to report on my desk in, you know, 30 minutes, da-da-da-da-da. It was, a, it was an interesting day. And at that point, the media were starting to show up because they're getting wind of this. They're out in the parking lots. So we got our communications people trying to hold him at bay. So that's the kind of guy he was. Like, it was hard charging. And he had people crying. And nobody lost their jobs, amazingly. And we estimated, I don't remember, I think it was like we lost $6 million or $8 million for the day, which wasn't the end of the world. Stores were resilient. Turns out they could run their store reasonably well without a computer. You hmm. know, they... They couldn't collect tax. Like, they didn't know, you know, it was, no, it was like, muffins, it's a buck. This is a buck, this is two bucks, this is three bucks. Kept it really simple. Anyway, it was, uh, it was an interesting thing. And it, it turns out, even just a couple years ago, now that we have, bi, even with, they have bi-directional communication, I, I read in the newspaper, it was not more than two or three years ago, they had the same thing happen. Really? They had a full outage. Hadn't happened since. So, yeah. So, that was just one little window into him. Just, you know how he would handle a situation. But, I mean, I think that speaks volumes. Tough, but no heads rolled. Yeah. I've often heard that um, from a number of people that I really, entrepreneurs and visionaries that I really, really respect, that don't fire someone over a mistake. Yeah. That's a learning experience. No doubt about it. And there were forensics done, you know, how do we prevent this and what went wrong and... So nothing unfair about that, right? I mean, it was a horrible situation, and it was a nightmare for everybody involved, but you were in battle. What else about Howard? Like I said earlier, he's very detail-oriented. We had this other experience, which was a f- another funny one. This was before I had gone to Seattle. We had this store in L.A. in Santa Monica. No, no sorry, it was, it was uh, called Beverly Connection. It was in a mall area, a little bit in by Beverly Hills. And it was a high, I mean, all the stores back then were very high volume, very busy. Nothing like you see today because, you know, now they've cannibalized them and there's other competitors. And so you, you just don't see the volumes. They were very, very busy stores. And apparent, and Howard would come in unannounced. So he had gone into this store unannounced. And, you know, most people wouldn't even know him from Adam. And he... Most of the frontline employees. Most of the frontline employees. So he, this store, he's watching apparently. And this store is a disaster. And the managers were off having a managerial meeting. So there were no managers on site. And 
the store was a, it was a wreck. It was a pit. And he was really, you know, he expected the stores to be clean and, you know, much, you know, customer service was, was paramount. So anyway, he goes up to the register and, and kind of politely and quietly says to the person at the register, you know, it's kind of messy out in the lobby. Can we get somebody out there to get it cleaned up? Yeah, yeah, we're really busy. We'll get to that. Kind of shuffles him off, right? So he backs off and apparently comes back up a little bit more pushy the next time. I'd like to get somebody out here. This is not acceptable. This is, you know, and the employee lays into him, like really becomes rude. You know, like, look, guy, we got other stuff to take care of, you know, piss off kind of a thing. And it was another experience where Howard had the whole management come in. There was a whole powwow about this. And my district manager was in charge of that store, you know, in our stores. And she's bawling, and she was required to put on his desk an after-action report on how this would never happen again. And heads rolled on that, not not essentially firing, but, you know, it, it got, it was heavy. And so we, forever, we had referred to that as BH and AH, before Howard and after Howard. People would say, oh, is that process a BH or AH? Oh, that's AH. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, he was, he was in the details. He was in the weeds and but a pleasant guy. I mean, all, all things, you know, I'm giving you some pretty extreme examples, but by and large, just a very pleasant guy. You know, he'd bring Magic Johnson and he were close friends and Magic would come to the offices and give us pep talks. And I mentioned Bill Bradley and, you know, he kind of ran with that interesting crowd and uh, mm. would give us exposure to that group. And we had amazing people. I mean, you know, no company is, is great because of one person. We had like the person who headed up our real estate and, and, and the design and all, all these things um, were world-class guys. So real estate-wise alone, you know, we won all kinds of awards and the offices were gorgeous and, and you know, a lot of office design and restaurant design have been modeled after Starbucks since then. So, so you were at Starbucks 10 years. Yeah. And then you said you went off on your own. Yeah, I started a little consultancy. They were our client for years, Starbucks. And really the goal was to find products that we could build. And we, that's how I ended up getting pulled into healthcare. And so took a turn and spent another, the next 18 years in, in uh, developing software and little businesses in the healthcare space. Which I say, I started at the largest drug company in the world and then went into the healthcare space, so... Even though, not technically a drug company, but caffeine probably the largest drug in the world. <laughs> so Tobin, you leave Starbucks, you get into healthcare. How did how did that happen? So Howard Schultz, we were just talking about. Both of his neighbors were doctors, ironically, both ophthalmologists, and at one point. One of them, who also happened to be the team doctor for the Seattle Supersonics, which no longer exist. Howard bought them at one point, and then a guy in, Can in Oklahoma City bought them and moved them down there. But in any event, he was the team doctor. So he was looking to implement electronic medical records, and I got asked to give him some advice because he was concerned. You know, these doctors are constantly being sold crap. And as it turns out, he didn't even have a network in his office, and he's looking to implement electronic medical records. I thought, we're getting a little bit of the cart before the horse here. So I helped him out with some billing and collections. What I found was a lot of these doctors weren't even collecting on 70% of their billable work. What? Yeah. Like, what weren't they collecting on? It, it, you know, the whole insurance and, and billing piece of the healthcare is just a racket. It's an absolute racket. And so insurance companies will commonly reject a claim initially. And I believe strongly a part of that game is they know that there's just not going to be follow-up in a lot of cases. And so they're not going to have to pay that. So when the claim gets rejected, a lot of these physician offices just, just stuff that bill in their drawer and that was the end of it. I'm simplifying it a little bit, but that's the gist of it. And so we used to call it the Porsche drawer, where we could go into any physician's office and help them collect, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars of billables within a month, 
stuff that they were owed that they were never going to collect on. And so we'd say, you can go buy yourself a new Porsche with the money that you just didn't even know you had. But anyway, that was my first introductory into physician offices. And I thought, these guys are really smart. They're actually a lot of fun to hang out with and work with. But they don't have the background and the time to become savvy in business and in all of these kinds of things. They're focused on patients, which they should be. So I started working more and more with physicians. I did invest, you know, I made investments with physicians. My office eventually was on the campus of a neuroscience institute in Seattle. And that led to my next project, which was working with a neurosurgeon at Stanford, which was a, he was a colleague of a lot of these guys. And so I agreed to help him start a software company. This guy had built a publicly traded device company, became very wealthy, but he wanted to start a software company, didn't know much about it. So I commuted down to Stanford in Palo Alto. Originally, I was going to do it for a few months, ended up doing it for a few years. It was a great learning experience, spending time down there. What did you learn? You know, when you think about the innovation that's come out of the Bay Area and Stanford, Think, well, why is that? What's so special? You know, is it the water? Is it the palm trees? It's the warm? No, it's none of that. It's a confluence of things. Um, first of all, you had a world-class engineering department and computer science department at Stanford. And so that was a piece of it. And you had a lot of entrepreneurs from the 70s who had made money in the silicon chip space. That's why it's called Silicon Valley. As that chip industry was growing, a lot of that was based down there. And as wealth was being generated there, it was reinvesting. It was staying there. And so this confluence of software talent with money started to fuel this whole space. And then you had world-class healthcare in, in Stanford and UCSF in particular. And so that's why, you know, there was this bleed over into biotech. And you had companies like Genentech that evolved out of there. The difference between there and, let's say, Seattle and other markets was for years and years in Seattle, when companies had a successful exit, oftentimes those parent companies would move the company out of Seattle. And so there was this brain drain, and that money would move with it. You didn't see the money staying there. What changed for Seattle was was Microsoft at first, and then later Amazon even more so, is the money started staying in Seattle. So they started to really ramp up in terms of the capital availability and they had the software talent from the University of Washington. So you had that same confluence there. You see a little bit of that, a little bit of that in Colorado. You've got CU Boulder with a great software engineering program. You see more and more people moving to Colorado for lifestyle reasons. You know, a lot of these quote family offices and people with money, they didn't necessarily make their money here. And there's lots and lots of examples of that. But you know, when I was growing up in Colorado, we had one billionaire. That was Marvin Davis. And then later, Phil Anschutz. Those were the only two billionaires. Now there's tons of them. But most of them did not make their money in Colorado. Hmm. They made their money in other industries, and they moved here, again, for lifestyle. lifestyle. Um, but back to your question, it, what I learned was, you know, I mean, software is eating the world, Right. Software is changing everything, and, and you know now the latest buzz is artificial intelligence. Well, that's just a, a field of software. And so if you draw a circle around these universities where that top engineering talent's coming, and as long as there's capital, you're going to see very, very innovative markets. So no surprise, Boston, New York, Stanford, and San Francisco, the Bay Area. And there's other examples. Uh, you know, Houston's got a lot going on. Dallas has got a lot going on, but you almost never see that kind of meteoric rise without a pool of engineering talent and a pool of money. Mm. Yeah. So you're going down to San Francisco working with this neurosurgeon. Yeah. So I did that for a couple of years. It was a great experience. And what I took away from that was in these healthcare companies, physicians really are the market makers. You know, physicians influence 80% of the spend in healthcare. There's a lot of historic shifts going on in that industry, but their influence remains significant. Now, what's counterbalancing that a little bit is that 20 years ago, 75% of physicians were in private practice. 
Now it's the opposite. 25% of them are in fi private practice. Most of them are employees. Turns out they're also horrible employees, but that's a separate issue. So private equity firms are rolling up these, these practices into big behemoths. Hospital systems even more so are buying up the private practices because they want that referral business. So that's a big shift uh, for the physician world. But physicians still influence the hospital decisions. They influence certainly patient decisions. And somebody taught me years ago that in any industry, follow the money. Right? If you don't know where the money is, you're not going to be successful. And, and he said at the time, this was a healthcare investor, he says, I'll give you the cliff notes. In healthcare, the money's only in one place. It's in the pharmaceutical and medical device industry, and predominantly the pharmaceutical industry. It's not with hospitals. They run on supermarket margins. Most of them are bankrupt. 50% of the hospitals in the United States are bankrupt. Hmm. Um, How are they staying afloat? Because they're considered utilities. And so, you know, they may not be bankrupt for long, but they're in the, they're in the red. You know, they'll get back in the black, but barely. You know, you saw during COVID, Cleveland Clinic hemorrhaging money. Cleveland Clinic, one of the largest in the country, hemorrhaging money. But they're back in the black. So it's cyclical. Uh, but many of them are just shutting down. And the, the only reason they won't shut down is, again, for this public utility issue. you got to have a certain amount of hospitals, and so they'll get propped up. They'll get bailouts. But the money's in the pharmaceutical and medical device industry, trillions of dollars, and the margins are enormous. And, um, you know, again, so hospitals, no money there. Insurance companies, people think they're fat cats. They're not. They have boom-bust cycles. Um, physicians, you know, they make good money as a profession. Professionals, they're successful, but their reimbursements are declining. Generally speaking, as employees, they're not, you know, they don't have money. As much money as they make, they got even more people after their money. So it's in the drugs and the devices. That was one of the things I learned in that process. So then I, we built a company to embed physicians into these startups so that we could utilize their influence, you know, they needed, we wanted them to be advocates. They really can move the needle. And so the idea was, and we had this billionaire physician as an investor, and he had this mantra, I don't predict winners, I build winners. He says, so I don't invest in public stocks. I don't put money in my 401k anymore. I used to invest in real estate and restaurants and oil and gas, and all those are fine. But he says, I want to invest in things that I can have a meaningful impact on and de-risk my investment. So for a physician, that happens to be in healthcare. An industry that they know. Industry that they know. And also, I mean, this is something you and I have talked about in some of our conversations, is that these doctors, they see a product that they would personally use and would be great in their field, and they could see other doctors in that field using it. And it's a very collegial industry. You know, they go to conferences throughout the year. They see all their buddies. They're on journal boards together. So it's it's... You know, we talk about social networks. Physicians had social networks back to the beginning of the profession, you know, in the form of these conferences, in the form of these journals. And so they're always networking. And so I might have an idea about whether this is going to be successful, but it's a f I'm a phone call away from 50 colleagues, an email nowadays from 50 colleagues or texting them or whatever. So they're very networked. It's a very small universe. There's only 800,000 doctors in the United States. How did you apply that insight into what we were doing? What you're doing? We deconstructed the LinkedIn business model and we thought, how do we integrate them into this efficiently, into this process? And so we created a platform. Um, Is where that AngelMD? Yeah, AngelMD, where we had four constituents, doctors, startups, investors, and industry, the buyers of these companies. And that was the other insight. Is build with the end game in mind. You know, people say, oh, I'm just building a great company. Well, that's great, but at some point, the investors want their money back. And the investors are going to make their money back when you sell the company. They're not, you know, financing your lemonade stand so you can sell lemonade for the rest of your life. They're selling, you know, building, building the lemonade stand to flip it to, to somebody. And uh, a few of them will go public, but statistically, most won't. They're going to get bought. And so when we think about who's going to buy that company, we want to have them involved earlier. So if that's Pfizer or if that's you know, Medtronic or United Healthcare, 
how do you get them involved in that company earlier to look at that and maybe potentially buy that company up? So all of those elements de-risk it. So we connected those four constituents. We started... Through uh, the platform, Angel MD. Through the platform. And then we created a proprietary system to evaluate startups. We became the largest network of medical startups in the world, thousands of startups. So then the question is... And 40,000 doctors in your... Yeah. On, on the list. Right. And across all disciplines. But the two biggies are orthopedics and cardiology. Mm. That's where 50% of the innovation happens. It's where all the money is, right? It's no surprise. But if you're looking at thousands of startups, how do you determine which ones to spend time with? And so we created a proprietary algorithm and process using the physician insights to say, you know, you got to be intellectually honest to say there's no one best company. In fact, we used to say, a company that we might think is a C company today might be a big winner. You don't know. Things are going to change. So you have to be intellectually honest enough to say you're going to be wrong. So rather than picking the best company, we'd say let's create an 80-20 paradigm. Try to figure out the top 20%. Now within that top 20%, which ones are going to be the home runs versus the base hits? You don't know. But at least you can apply more time and money to that 20% and forget the 80%. And give that 80% a pathway to prove that they're in the 20% and they missed them. And, and it's different than the venture capital model. The venture capital model is, you know, five guys in a room thinking they're the smartest guys in town. And they're going to sit and look at every single deal that comes through and thumbs up, thumbs down. It's, it's just a ton of bias built into that. And a lack of data, a lack of looking at the law of patterns. Uh, and as a result, if you look at the statistics, most venture capital firms don't return profit. 5% of the venture capital firms make all the money. Mm. So the other 95% are either breaking even or losing money. Mm. And so that begs the question, well, why has so much money gone into venture capital over the 10 years? And the answer is because there's so much capital looking for yield. They can't get yield in the public markets anymore. Yeah. You know, when you got Goldman Sachs essentially telling the the huge sovereign funds, you should be happy with a 4% return for the next 10 years. Like 4% return, you're losing money on 4%. So money has chased alternative investments, i.e. private investments, whether that's real estate, private equity, venture capital, all of those categories. And so there's an unending supply of money, but the yields for most of them aren't there. So there's a reckoning coming in that space. There's been a lot of talk about that this last year. And there's a saying in venture capital that everybody can raise one fund, can they raise a second fund? And the reason they say that is, you know, you can come up with your uh, your thesis and go out and raise whatever that first fund is, but the second fund is going to be evaluated on the performance of your first fund. And if you're a crappy fund manager, you're probably not going to be successful raising that second fund. And that's true for most. Hmm. They don't have any differentiation, especially in the Bay Area where you're churning out venture capitalists left and right. And they're basically a bunch of kids who can, you know, they're masters at Excel spreadsheets. And at 26 years old, they're sitting on the boards of startups. They've never run a business. They've never worked in a business. But somehow they're going to add value. It's, it's ridiculous. The best venture capitalists, in my experience, are the ones who have run and or worked in corporations, and then they're coming and applying that operating experience to their investing acumen. They're not number crunchers. They're operators. Mm. Big difference. Yeah. So AngelMD, we have been iterating on that. We got into that to essentially facilitate these early stage investments. And when did you start it? 2014 is when we really got started. Uh, I shouldn't say that. It's when we technically got started. We really didn't get started in earnest until 2017 because the laws were shifting. There was a huge piece of legislation called the Jobs Act, the biggest change in securities laws since 1934. And the SEC had not really weighed in on what you could do and not do. What, what it really facilitated was the ability to invest through crowds, to uh, invest through online platforms. None of that existed before. And then you could do what was called general solicitation. So it used to be if the four of us were friends, we could invest together. But I couldn't put an ad in a newspaper about an investment. That was, it was illegal. Now you can do that. Hmm. And, and so that allowed you to get your message out to a much larger audience of people. 
and crowdfunding allowed smaller investors to put small amounts of money into things. And so it got people off the sidelines. So we did that. We facilitated about 50 different investments. We had a fund. But what we found was by late 2019, we were getting what I would say are false positives. We were getting certain indications that this was going to be successful from the standpoint of we thought we were selecting really good companies to invest in, and the track record has shown that we have. Most of these companies have been trucking along nicely. Physician, a lot of physician interest, a lot of interest from industry. Startups were, were enormously interested. Like I said, we had thousands and thousands of startups applying. The challenge was you ended up looking like a venture capital firm, but you don't. we didn't have a fund, a large fund, where we could secure uh, management fees. So there was really no underlying revenue model. You were, you were banking on the future success of these startups. And so we had a number of advisors, one in particular, who said, you should not be defined as, a, as an investment company. Your real asset here is your physician network, your membership. And so we divested the investment business just before COVID. And we were fortunate to do that. And we really focused in on how do we turn this membership into a, a monetizable asset. And, and so it ends up looking much like any other new media platform, like a Facebook. In healthcare, there's one called Doximity. And really, they're all the same. They're just networks of members, and you're selling advertising against that. But in healthcare, again, you've got this unique audience of advertisers in the pharmaceutical and medical device companies, and their entire business relies on access to doctors. And their access to doctors has been plummeting over the last 10 years. How so? Why? Mostly for regulation. So drug reps used to be able to take doctors to the Broncos football game. They used to be able to take them to steak dinners. They used to be able to bring them donuts, pens, anything. Can't do any of that anymore. None of it. It's all been regulated out. So that's the primary reason. The secondary reason is, as I mentioned earlier, physicians are now employees. And so hospitals have no interest in having the pharmaceutical rep go talk to their employees. They want those employees seeing patients. That makes them money. So now that the physicians don't control their time, they don't have the drug reps don't get access to them. So that access has been decimated. And so what the companies, drug companies have done, they're not stupid and they're not going to go away. They have to figure out how do we get to these guys because if the doctor's not prescribing their drug, it's not getting sold. So what they figured out was doctors are spending time online like everybody else. So they started pumping advertising into online channels. So that doximity I mentioned, they went public during COVID and they hit a $5 billion valuation. And that $5 billion is 100% because they're providing a direct channel to doctors for advertisers. And people say, well, what are they doing on Doximity? The answer is it doesn't really matter. They could be on there hosting a basket weaving club or posting pictures of their cats. As long as they're there, Pfizer, Merck can reach them. Uh, That's not what they're doing there. But my point being, it doesn't really matter what the platform does. As long as you have an audience and they're engaged, you can sell advertising against that. What does Doximity do what AngelMD doesn't and vice versa? Yeah, it's a good question. We got lucky. You know, like every startup, I would say you got to have some luck. And we did not anticipate that what we were doing, we were really becoming a platform for the after hours and weekend projects of doctors, whether it was their business projects, their business interests, their interest in wine, lifestyle things, sports. It was all these things that they were doing on our network. And so that's what they did on AngelMD. It was all these after hours things. On Doximity, it's all these tools to help them during their clinical workday. So mm. one of those is a is an auto dialer. So physicians a lot of times are on their cell phone, right? They're out playing golf and they gotta take a call with a patient. Well, they don't want to call from their cell phone. Now the patient's got their cell phone number. So you call through this auto dialer and the phone number comes in as Dr. Smith, but it doesn't give the phone number. It's masked, and that's what they, they so that's one of the tools. They give you that for free. Hmm. Well, they give you that for free because now you're on the Doximity platform. Or they give you access to CME, continuing medical education credits. So you go take a course on Doximity and get credits because you have to accumulate a certain number of hours every year. Why are they giving away free CME? Because they're able to sell advertising to the doctors. So they create a number of tools like that that are really relevant to their clinical work. So 
we sort of facetiously say doximity is everything that doctors do during the day. We're everything else. And the reason we got lucky is we don't want to have the doctor's attention during the day. They're busy. They're seeing patients. They have 30 seconds in between those patients. They don't have time to digest some product idea from Pfizer. When do they have time for that? When they're checking new ideas out after mm. hours on the weekends when they're playing around on AngelMD. So it's a much better time slot for the pharmaceutical companies, the medical device companies to reach the doctor. Hmm. So that's what we do differently. And then um, last year I formed what we're referring to as a venture studio. And that venture studio will end up looking more and more like a private equity firm. But what we have built are a series of services that we perform for companies that we have learned over time move the needle for those companies. And we're doing that work for third-party clients, out external clients, small businesses. And our goal over time is to do more and more of that work for our own companies, companies that we've invested in or have acquired. And we will launch some funds so that we are, have capital to deploy into those companies. But those include media, marketing, software, and then also business consultancy. So those four categories. And so AngelMD has actually become... We're converting that into a client of the firm, and that's what we're spending time on now. And for full transparency, I'm in discussions and with you. That's right. To join about the being, team, being one of those principals. That's right. With specifically around media. That's right. And our clients, you know, we're agnostic in terms of industry, but we're the sweet spot are really the the growth companies with roughly 10 to 50 employees, and kind of three to 50 million in revenue. So it's that company that says, whether they're in real estate, whether they're in manufacturing, says, we need to grow. We don't have a media and marketing department, or if we do, they're small. And we need, you know, at the end of the day, we're not in the business of performing services. We're in the business of building growth. We're in the business of accomplishing goals for the business. We, we happen to perform the services that get there, but we really don't care about being in a services business. We were really in the business of delivering results. Why? Because our long-term goal is to apply those same results to companies in which we own equity. And so that's the big differentiator. We want to sit alongside the business owner and say, we want to help you accomplish your goals because we're using the same principle, the same tools and the same methodologies to do that for companies that we own. So it's a fun transition. But, you know, the Lord, if we're listening, guides us and... and uh, had started to put on my heart about three years ago. There was a new season, a new transition coming. And I still believed, and still believe, you know, with Angel MD, it was time to transition that business. I say, every business, the entrepreneur needs to begin making themselves irrelevant at some point. Because if it's relying on them, it's not a great business. And it needs to be converted to a company, you know, somebody that's going to operate it, be the operator. And so Angel MD, it was time for that, for Angel MD. And, and we really had to take a hard look during COVID, whether that was a company we even wanted to keep going. You know, there was some question about whether that really? was... Really? Yeah. You know, the world was shut down. Our offices were shut down. And um, we had pivoted the model. We were in the middle of raising institutional money. We had two investors lining up in January of 2020. We're in diligence. And I'm watching the monitor early March 2020. Lockdowns are beginning thought there's no way these investors are moving forward so those institutional investors both pulled out you know within months and so we were caught holding the bag do we keep this thing going do we shut it down and uh, we came to the conclusion you know you don't want to chase good money after bad they say same thing you don't want to chase good time after bad because you, you can get money back you can't get time back and I firmly believed and still believe that the model for what we were doing is actually even more relevant today than it was five years ago. Why? It's because, again, the world has shifted. These uh, pharmaceutical and medical device companies have lost their access. They need access, so they need a solution. Healthcare innovation is at an all-time high in terms of the public interest in that, whether it's wellness solutions and how do we not just put band-aids on things until we you know plop into the grave but how do we live healthily until we're whatever 80 90 100 on down to the baby boomers who are getting hip surgeries and want to have a better full knee or hip replacement than was available 15 years ago so everybody has a vested interest in innovation in healthcare 
and COVID, I think, brought that more to the forefront. You know, now you have people talking about epidemiology that never even knew what that word meant three years ago. And, you know, talking about, uh, you know, everything from genetics to how drugs are made and, and, and how vaccines are made. You know, and so everybody's a, a couch expert these days that would have never discussed this stuff, you know, three years ago pre-COVID. So healthcare has always been important. It's a huge macro trend. It's the biggest part of our economy, but it's even bigger today than it was three or four years ago. And that's weighed into the favor of Angel MD. Um, so for those reasons, we thought it's the model is even more viable today. Um, we need to get more crisp in what it's doing. And it's time for an operator, an operating team to run it. Um, and so for those reasons, it was time to transition it, but keeping it going. With all your years of being around the healthcare space, what do you see are the biggest problems and what kinds of solutions are really within reach of taking steps in the right direction for our, for our, really it's a sick care system, not a health care system. Well put. So the answer to that question is an entire PhD. But the short answer is you, you hit on a big piece of that, which is shifting from, from patchwork and, you know, putting band-aids on things to wellness and, and, and really health care, well care. But the biggest challenge to that is is money. Where does who pays? And you know, there's some great companies out there that are doing some interesting things. One of them is actually a company that has some roots here in Colorado Springs. It's run by a physician by the name of Dinesh Danagari. He's actually at the Cleveland Clinic, but he comes here to Colorado Springs and uh, once a month he does work with Centura, I believe. But he's created a company that is working to help people navigate healthcare proactively, keeping the costs low, and really trying to triage. How are, they, how are they keeping those costs low? So, I, I think you and I have talked a little bit about this. Yeah, so, you know, one of the things is staying out of the ER. You know, one of the trends is that consumers have consistently been using the ER, the emergency room, or the urgent care more and more as primary care, and it's very expensive. You know, you're taking very limited resources to go in and figure out you have COVID or go in and figure out you got a sore throat and maybe have strep. And almost all that crap can be solved through telehealth, through very, very efficient means that don't require a hospital. That's the most expensive way to do it. But on the wellness side, you know, they're also helping people look at and, and, the, and more and more we can look at things like, you know, do blood testing and genetics testing and identify weaknesses in our predisposition because we all have you know weaknesses in our disposition and many of those can be offset through diet exercise you know the usual suspects but but also supplementation you know there are certain diseases and predispositions that through a a a two dollar a month supplement you can take your chances of getting some disease from 90 percent down to 10 percent two big ones that americans are pretty deficient at are vitamin d and magnesium Right there. Simple, right? You know, one of the really interesting guys in this space is a physician who also is the guy that started the X Prize. Um, Peter Diamandis. Peter Diamandis. And so Peter has a great book, The Future. Is it The Future that's faster than you think? That's one of his. He's got another one. I can't, I, abundance I, is one. It's not abundance. It's his most recent one. But he talks about... Yeah, the future is faster than you think. The future is faster than you think. So he goes through some of the advances that are coming in healthcare and other industries and not like 10 years out, like two years out. And one of the biggest is CRISPR-2. CRISPR-2 is gene editing. And he estimates that 20,000 diseases, 20,000 diseases that have been around since the beginning of time. Will Sickle be cell ruined. anemia yeah. in one of them. Wiped out. Like will be eradicated with CRISPR. And so we're right there on the cusp of stuff like that. You're on the cusp of when you look at musculoskeletal changes, PRP and injection, you know, stem cell injections. PRP, which is platelet-rich plasma. Yeah. And, and so it's, you know, it's very, uh, it doesn't require surgery. You know, you're taking blood out. You're, they're spinning it and putting it back in. We, you know, we have friends just anecdotally who five years ago, that would have been an automatic knee surgery yeah. or shoulder surgery. 
and go in for PRP injections and 100%. The body has the ability to heal itself. You just got to give it the tools that it needs in order to actually do it. That's right. Stem cells, PRP, those kinds of things. And, you know, you know, I, you and I talk about, there's a lot of other trends, saunas, cold plunges, all these things that are becoming hot. But think, you know, I mean, go back a couple of years. Were people talking about that? There was a fringe, very fringe audience. Now it's freaking all over social media. And it's, you know, the Joe Rogans of the world. It's become mainstream. And so I think a lot of that speaks to the wellness. So to answer your question, one of the things that Dr. Danagari talks about in his book called Health Guardians, and it's, it's well done. He looks at the history of healthcare in the United States. And he looks at the point at which we started paying for health care through our employers. And there were good reasons for it, but it's completely bastardized the system. And then you brought in insurance companies, which are not really acting as insurers. When you look at what they do, they're acting as payment processors. That's not what they're good at. They're good, you know, insurance is a risk business. It's a pooled risk business. But what they're essentially doing is prepaying health care. And so you look at employer health rates skyrocketing, um, the bottom line is the consumer has no input into the cost of that. When you look at the average union employee, right, they typically have Cadillac health care plans. The average union employee, the last I looked at the statistic, was something like their family visits the doctor 50 times a year. Wow. 50. Wow. If they were paying for that out of their pocket, how many times do you think they'd go to the doctor? Two, three, four. Two, three, four, maybe. All right, so they're going in when they got a need a Band-Aid. They're going in when they got a sore throat. They're going in for nonsense because it doesn't cost them anything. They have no visibility and connection to price and cost. No visibility to price. You know, I mean, you get the bill from a hospital or a doctor these days. You're going to get multiple bills. They're, you know, they're confusing. The first bill you get's not even the right real bill. So all of that crap has to be stripped away. So you look at more and more of these models where it's just getting back to patient-physician relationship Concierge medicine. Concierge medicine. They post, here's the cost. And by the way, there's a Delta right here in Colorado Springs. If you need an MRI, we could find a place that'll do that MRI for $750, or you could find it for $3,500. Same MRI. So (laughs) when you have no price transparency or consideration, you don't care. So they're going to send you to the $3,500 one. But if you're paying for it, you're going to find that $750 one. So it's things like that. Slowly, we're going to get smarter about that. But it may break the may break the economy first. We'll see. You know, it's twenty one percent of the GDP now. It's unsustainable, and that's growing by four hundred billion a year. Yeah, it'll bankrupt us. Why are insurance companies? Because they're in the risk business. Why are they not more focused on preventative medicine? than what they are. They're really, they're reactive. There's a lot of reasons for that, but... Because you would, you would think that, I mean, with the technology now, in listening to and reading Peter's books, the book that he did with uh, um, Tony Robbins, Life Force, other books like P- Dr. Peter Atiyah's book, mm-hmm. uh, Outlive, mm-hmm. and... Dr. David Sinclair's book, Lifespan, Why We Age, Why We Don't Have To, my yeah. good friend, Dr. Jeffrey Gladden's book, 100 is the New 30. These innovations that are coming in this healthcare space, specifically between using AI mm. and a full body MRI to detect stage zero or stage one or stage two cancer tumors, blood tests that are able to do that now. Yeah. Why are insurance companies not, okay, You get part of your yearly checkup is a full scan, so that way... We, we can run it through AI and detect pancreatic cancer when it's treatable right. than when it's stage three or four and it's untreatable and, you're, and it's a death sentence. We're, we're, I think we're moving there. We're inching there. So I think there are our insurance companies starting to play around with some of the wellness, you know, let, really just as a cost reduction measure for them. But it all comes back to the complexity. When you look at the number of hands that are in the midst, middle of these transactions, it's complicated. You know, you've got third-party payers in there, the insurance 
uh, companies in there and sometimes multiple insurance companies in there. You got the provider system and that provider system may have subcontractors behind the scenes. In other words, it might be the hospital, but then the hospital might be subbing out to a physician group, might be subbing out to an anesthesia group, might be subbing out to, you know, so there's so many hands in the pie there. It makes it tricky. And and you've also got in the insurance world these brokers that control the industry, the insurance brokers. And so that's why there's a new movement around who brokers these policies. And so you've got this independent brokerage audience, and, I, and the name's escaping me at the moment. It's around this Rosetta movement, and it's, it's a whole network of brokers that have um, pledged to be independent of the insurance companies, so they're not beholden to the insurance companies. Mm. And so they will push employers to these independent, like concierge medicine groups. And so you're starting to see it whittle away at the system, but it's still at the margins right now, right? It's the fringes, even HSAs, you know, health savings accounts is another example. Health savings accounts, I put money as an employer and, and as an employee into this account, I draw my expenses from that account. What's ever left over at the end of the year, I get to keep on a tax-deferred basis. It's an incredible financial tool. And yet, only about 10% of the population has used HSAs, and those were adopted by President Bush. So it's been around for a long time. Well, why is it capped at 10%? What's keeping that other 90% from moving from a traditional insurance plan to an HSA? And that's just inertia and politics. You know, there's huge vested interests in not moving those dollars out of United Healthcare into an HSA, which is run, controlled typically by a bank or a banking institution. So money and power. Um, but people are getting fed up. Employers can't, can't afford it. And so you're seeing the, the systems cracking. And, you know, when it cracks and there's enough pain, then people will start looking at alternative models. You also see a shift from to value-based care from care that was basically, you know, there's another issue in there that's, that's lit, lit, litigation. And so as a physician, I cover my ass by sending you out for unlimited numbers of tests because if I miss a test, God forbid I get sued because I missed something. So people are over-tested. Every one of those MRIs, every one of those blood tests costs money. But when you look at value care and it's about the cost and the value and not having readmissions, you start to align incentives more effectively. So if the physician is incentive by treatment, then they have no concern about cost. And that's how they've been compensated, the provider systems for decades. And it is shifting quickly to value care, value-based care. So you're seeing it still, you're seeing some movement at the fringes, but your question's a complex one. It's, if this was simple, it would have been solved. <laughs> but, but healthcare is, 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 I don't think there's another example of a more complex industry in the United States and as large as it is. I mean, it's yeah. everybody who gets into this space thinking they're going to, oh, we're going to solve it. These healthcare people are idiots, you know, and th there's been movements like that. There was a group called Rock Health in the Bay Area, and it was this movement to get a bunch of techies from Facebook and Zynga and these companies, you know, get these smart tech kids. We'll go figure out this stupid healthcare stuff. These people are idiots. You know, they're a bunch of, of old fogies. And then they got into healthcare and realized it's actually a little more complex than we thought. Maybe we can't write some simple software to fix this. And, and that's the reality. It's non-trivial. Well, for listeners that are interested in this and they want to learn a little bit more, a book that I read two years ago, by Dr. Marty Macaray. I think that's how you pronounce his name. The Price We Pay, What Broke American Healthcare and How to Fix mm -hmm. It, I think is a great starting point for those that are interested, those two or three listeners probably that are interested in this like I am. Um, that's a great book for them to listen to or, or read. Well, and the wellness part of that industry is, you know, is also a lot of fun. It's not just more cost effective, you know, where when, if you look at the cost that we spend, we spend almost all of our costs on the chronic disease, right? So it's, it's cardio, you know, cardi, cardiac disease first and foremost. Lung Diabetes. Diabetes is, is certainly in there and cancer. And, and not surprisingly, most of them are interrelated. 
And so we, if you look at that, that's a huge, huge chunk of the healthcare spend is in managing those chronic diseases. And I use the word managing because we really aren't solving them. We're just keeping those people afloat. And then we spend an enormous amount of money in those last two years of life trying to prop somebody up, which doesn't also make sense. And so, you know, I think the idea around wellness for most people, I mean, yes, people want to live longer, you know, be great to live to 120, I suppose. But I think what people are even more interested in Health is... Span. Yeah, living you know, healthy. I'm as fine long living as they to 85, can. but I want to live like I'm a 50 year old till I'm 85. Not like I don't want to live like an 85 year old starting at 50. And so that's I think where a lot of that promises come in, and it's fun. You know, it's it's all that hacking for people that have intellectual curiosity is interesting. It's like, huh, I found a difference when I did this. There's inputs and outputs, so I think it very much appeals to the the 30, 40, 50 year old crowd it's always kind of had that knack for testing things and, you know, whatever. So cold plunges. That's the, an- <laughs> that's the answer, Steve. That'll fix everything. <laughs> Not quite. Everybody but just needs a cold shower. <laughs> and so, more cigars. That's the answer. That's really the answer. Cold actually, plunges, year- cold plunge sauna and cigars. Yeah, actually years ago I had, I had this friend who was a cardiologist and I said to him, you know, what's your take on smoking cigars? And he said, you're much more likely to die of stress-related disease than you are of lung disease. So the answer is, if you're smoking cigars and it it de-stresses you, you should be smoking every day. Not five cigars a day, but, you know. Yeah. And I've I've, I've never forgot that. Yeah, and on the podcast, on this podcast, a couple years ago, I interviewed one of my doctors, Dr. Abed Hussein, was a functional medicine doctor up in Denver. Mm-hmm. And that's exactly what he said, too. He, he said, listen, when, when you get this thing in your hand, it slows you down. And you have real conversations with men, for guys, with men, and yeah. some women, too. But, I mean, you, you have these authentic, real conversations, and it slows us down. And that's, he, he said, the very, 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 very minimal increase in cancer when you smoke more than three cigars per day it's negligible when you consider the the benefits of just being slowed down. Yeah. My mom still doesn't buy that. She still gives me crap when she knows I'm smoking cigars. I'm like, Mom, my cardiologist told me to smoke more. <laughs> so every year when New Year's comes around, you know, and we're talking about resolutions, I always tell my parents, one of my resolutions this year is to drink more and smoke more. <laughs> it doesn't go over very well. <laughs> Mom's still not buying it. So we touched on this new venture innovation for alpha Mm -hmm. how do people find out how do business owners that are listening find out a little bit more about what we're doing and how we could possibly come alongside and help them we are in the process of building some educational tools so we're going to have an online community and those educational tools will allow business owners to come learn some things uh, about media built, you know, building content. Content is king. How do you take that content and turn it into lead generation, whatever those leads are for you? And that's, that's marketing. And so we're going to build some training and education for people to educate themselves. And so that's a, that'll be a step. Those will be available in the next couple of weeks. And we're recording this in mid-January 2024. So, you know, by the middle of Q1, we'll have these tools available. And we will create a community where we will be connecting um, our premium members so they can continue to learn and learn from one another. And we'll be pumping out things as we're learning. And then certainly our website, innovationforalpha.com, will be a, a, an anchor for that. And that's innovation, the number four, alpha.com. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, it goes it's probably worth mentioning the the term alpha is a fun one for us. It means multiple things. And, you know, alpha in finance means above average. You're looking for above average returns, but it's also a reference to our creator. And, and so this is a firm that is decidedly run by a team of Christian technicians, if you will, professionals. And it doesn't mean that our clients are all necessarily Christian. Certainly not. We want to help everyone. But, um, we bring that lens to everything that we do 
and it's a it's an important part of our internal culture and so it's a little bit of a nod both our goal is to to help you be above average and get above average results and we do that not because uh we're, we're all that special but because of the the uh, the one that created us is special so tobin arthur let's get to rapid fire questions fire away Hey everyone, I wanted to announce that we have Holy Smokes gear. That's right, we have swag. We currently have hats, shirts, stickers, like for your vehicle or your travel humidor, magnets, even branded bourbon glasses for a limited time. Go to holysmokes.club and click on the shop tab. That's holysmokes.club. I'm super proud of the shirts. They're made with Bella Canvas shirts that are soft and incredibly comfortable. The hats fit wonderfully, which can be a problem for those of us with big noggins. We plan on having a lot more to offer, like Guayabara shirts, additional t-shirt designs, beanies, polos, hoodies, cigar accessories, and much more. Check it out. And even if you don't make a purchase now, be sure to sign up for that email list, as I've thrown a couple big discount coupon codes for those exclusively on that list. So click the shop tab at holysmokes.club. Thanks. Rapid fire. Here. How's that stick treating you? I like the stick. I like the flavor. It's a t- it's a difficult one to keep lit. Because you're talking so much. It's partly because I'm talking. I think it's it's usually also because of how it's wrapped. Every cigar is going to be a little different. This one in particular has had a little bit of challenge, but I like it. It's got a good flavor profile. It's crossfire, not, Maduro. Crossfire Maduro. It's not super complex, but it's a good average stick. Yeah. When did you first try cigars or pipe? It was with with my mates that I was living with shortly after college. And um, so, yeah, all through our 20s, it was coffee and cigars, man. Really wasn't much of a drinker ever. Kind of picked up bourbon later in life. But that's the answer. What's your favorite cigar? My very favorite cigar overall is probably, you know, I really like... Illusiones and Tatuajes. I love Illusiones. Yeah, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm partial to, to both of those. Yeah, I'd stick with those. They're kind of a fun niche cigar. Have you ever tried their one-off? Yep. It's probably my favorite stick. Yeah. It's probably my single favorite stick. It was the first stick, I've said this on the podcast a few times, the first stick I ever fell in love with. That it was like, whoa, this is almost transcendent. Tatuaje used to do some... Um, some limited edition cigars and they had a Halloween edition. So it was always fun to try and get a hold of some of those. And so some of the shops that I frequented would get some limited runs and we'd, we'd grab those. So yeah, I'm impartial to those and love if we can get the right ones, um, Monte Cristos, but there's a lot of fake Monte Cristos out there. And, uh, but if you can get the right ones, they're heavenly. I have a connection here in Holy Smoke, so I'll introduce you to sometime. He can. Okay. He can, he can get us some. You know, speaking of which, we should organize. So, so Vertigo Club in Seattle um, used to do a yearly trip down to the Dominican, and they did some to Nicaragua as well. But they go down for the cigar fest. I believe it was in February. I never went, but it was apparently amazing because you've got the food. You tour all the cigar companies. We ought to do a Holy Smokes tour down there. It'd be a lot of fun. <laughs> Let's talk to Kay and get that on the calendar. Most expensive cigar you've ever smoked? The the cigar itself would have been a Monte Cristo. You know, back when they were even more difficult to get a hold of. But, you know, probably an 80 or $90 stick. Best dollar for dollar stick that you get. I'd come back to Luzione. I mean, for under $15, every time it's... And the thing I like about them is there's some complexity, and they're unique. And I'll equate this to coffee. You know, in the coffee world, if you're in the middle of Timbuktu and there's a Starbucks and there's nothing else, great. You know what you're going to get. But it's not special. It's homogenized. And that's just the nature of being a huge company. You have no choice but to homogenize. 
But when I can find a craft coffee maker, just like a craft cigar maker, where I know they're not making 500,000 sticks, there's a difference. But you pay for that difference typically, right? I mean, it costs more money to do stuff than small batches, whether it's wine, cigars, or coffee. So if I have my choice, I'm going to go with the small batch maker. Where's your go-to place to get your smokes? So my go-to place has always been Hemingway's in Palo Alto. And the guy, it's on, it's right downtown Palo Alto. It's an awesome store. And the great thing is he's got the sticks in the front. But if you're a regular customer, there's a whole different inventory that's not even out. And he'll know. And so I loved going there. But, I, but you know, since I moved to Denver, 2018, it's five years now. Especially in Denver, I have not really found a place that I'm particularly, you know, c- connected to. There are better shops here in Colorado Springs. Really? But, yeah. And it's not to say you can't get stuff up there. I just, I don't really have an affinity to any one particular store up there yet. Most interesting person you've met through cigars? I've been fortunate to meet a lot of super cool people through cigars over the years. And I don't know that I could rule a single any any one person out, but I'll mention my friend Norris Bacho, who is a member of the Vertigo Club and just one of my favorite human beings on the planet. He's a character. But here's a funny story about Nor- Norris, which will tell you kind of why I think he's such a fun guy. So there's a club in the San Francisco called the Bohemian Club. It's an old, very exclusive club. Norris was always telling me, we got to go the Bo- got to come down to the Bohemian Club with me in San Francisco. So at one point, I was down in San Francisco for work, and Norris was also down there, and he said, come to the Bohemian Club. So I meet Norris at the Bohemian Club. We go in, we have cigars, we go have dinner, we come back and have cigars. Everybody knows Norris. We get to leave, and I said, how long have you been a member of Bohemian Club, Norris? He says, I'm not a member of the Bohemian Club. I said, what do you mean you're not a member of the Bohemian Club? Well, everybody thinks I am, because I'm here all the time. And my friend Steve lets me use his member number. And so I just sign everything off on his number so they don't know otherwise. Only Norris could pull off the fact that he's not even a member of Bohemian Club, and the Bohemian Club members think he's a member of Bohemian Club. (laughs) He is the funnest character I've ever met. Speaking of clubs, you're looking at starting one. Yes. Up in Denver at some point in the next year, year and a half. Yeah. Social club. You know, I've learned and been blessed over the years to be part of really cool communities. And when I left Seattle and we had that vertical club, I missed that. You know, it's very difficult to replace that. It was just a, it was an outsourced man cave. And by the way, it wasn't all men. One of my very best friends I met there is a woman who's one of the leading video game engineers in the world. And she was a member, loved cigars, and her husband did not. He came, he was, he was awesome. He just didn't, wasn't a cigar guy. He'd come hang out. But we're going to start a club. It's going to be a social club with uh, wine lockers and, and so forth, some snacks, We're looking to probably do it at the Centennial Private Airport in South Denver as a starting point. And then we'll have a club within a club uh, around cigars because not everybody's into cigars. So we want to accommodate both crowds. And um, I'm excited about it. It's the goal is not to be, you know, necessarily make money as a business, but to facilitate a really unique community for people that just want to use cigars and wine and food as an excuse to hang out and chat and get to know each other so coming soon to a theater near you favorite liquid pairing with your smoke i always love coffee as we we experienced today i love we used to do um, dinners at the vertigo club we were very fortunate we had a member jason williams who's a james beard award-winning chef Mm -hmm. and he and the founder of the vertigo club would pair up with one of the other members who was a spirits distributor and they would do Five to seven course dinners with Whoa. five cigars and Whoa. five different wines. Whoa. It was amazing. Best things I've ever done in my life. And it was a four or five hour event at Jason's restaurant. And um, there was nothing more fun than that. And they really put thought into why this dish with this cigar with this wine. And you just, it was a whole story. It was an experience. 
But the short answer is, even though I love cigar and wine, or a wine and coffee, my favorite is bourbon. Love bourbon. What bourbon? I'm ambivalent. I really, you know, bourbon is an area, unlike coffee and wine, where I'm not as particular yet. Um, partly, as we were discussing a little bit earlier, some of that's access. In Colorado market, we don't have access to bourbons that, you know, for example, if you live in Tennessee or Kentucky, you've got access to. So, um, you know, my mainstream daily drink, I don't drink daily, but my regular go-to is just bullet, bullet rye. You can get it everywhere. It's not expensive. Most memorable cigar experience? The dinners that I just mentioned. Nice. By far and away. All right. For the non-cigar questions, Marvel or DC? Marvel. Favorite superhero when you were a kid? Uh, Flash Gordon. Ooh. He's never been named. Why? He was unique. And... um, you know, I mean, you know, uh, certainly love Spider-Man, Superman, all the others, but but Flash was, um, he was unique and he was smart. Star Wars or Star Trek? Ooh, I'd probably go with Star Trek, but I would throw in there, I like Battlestar Galactica better than both. Ooh, why? Because I think that the storylines are more complex. And the characters are more complex. And there's a new one coming out, by the way. Really? They're redoing this, a third generation. But I really got into that. And what what I realized as I got into that series was, much like all of them, but you could take the science fiction and the space travel out of it all, and the stories were still the stories. That was just the excuse. Really had nothing to do with any of that. Like all great stories. Much like, I suppose... Yellowstone doesn't really have anything to do with ranches. It just happens to be on a ranch if you've got good storylines. I remember Battlestar Galactica when I was a kid. The Cylons were just the coolest bad guys. Yeah, 100%. Way cooler than Stormtroopers. Yeah. And, and the ship designs were really cool as well. Yeah, yeah. I had that whole CD, a whole DVD series. It was awesome. Sports teams. Uh Hundred percent Dodgers, Broncos, and couldn't care less about basketball, and couldn't care less about hockey. But if I picked hockey, it'd certainly be the Avalanche. Favorite athlete growing up? Athlete? Yeah. Probably have to be Jordan. What kinds of music do you love? I love everything, but if I'm listening on a day-to-day basis, it's piano. Christian contemporary country, probably in that order. Do you have a favorite band when you were a teenager, U2. college years? You too, hundred percent. And you were at? I was at the filming of the Sunday Bloody Sunday video. That's their famous video that blew them up at Red Rocks back in, I believe, nineteen eighty four. Talk about that story because we were talking about that before yeah. we started recording. That was an incredible one. It was just one of those ones that happened accidentally. So. YouTube was coming. They were big at this point, so it was really their first big tour. But they were all were already well known, so they were playing Red Rocks, a big venue in Denver, outdoor venue. And it was storming. It had been storming for a day, and so the concert was essentially canceled. Everybody assumed it was canceled, but nobody had formally announced it as canceled. But nobody was going to Red Rocks. We were in high school and, you know, we were slipping a few drinks. I wasn't really a drinker, but for that we we had a few drinks. And so we went up there, and the pouring rain's freezing out. There's nobody. There's, like, little pockets of people kind of huddled up in the amphitheater. What time of the year was that one recorded? You know, I should go back and look, because I don't recall. I just remember it was rainy and cold, so it must have been, like, late fall. Okay. Or late spring, right? That's kind of the time frame when that would happen in, in Denver. But I don't recall exactly. It wasn't snowing. It was raining. So, But it was frigid. I remember that because everybody was drinking to stay warm. But what happened was <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the weather started to clear a little bit. And then out of the back, Bono comes out walking around the audience. I mean, the audience of like 50 of us. And high-fiving everybody and grabs the microphone and says, 
They told us we can't do the concert because of the weather, the rain and the electricity don't mix. And so they want us to cancel. And he said, screw them, we're going on. And everybody goes crazy, all 50 of us. <laughs> and the radio stations all start broadcasting immediately. The concert's on, the concert's on. And so everybody in Denver's jumping in their cars and getting up to Red Rocks for the concert that was otherwise not going because everybody assumed it was not happening. So within a half an hour, people are pouring in. Red Rocks is not that far. And I remember the helicopter is circling, and it had to be illegal because the cloud cover was so thick, but you could see the beam on the helicopter kind of up there in the clouds. And that's the helicopter that ended up filming that video. And so Bono comes out in the rain, and he's got the flag, and he's marching through the crowd and, you know, high-fiving people. And so you see all that on that video. And that video, I think, is the number one video, music video of all time. And just blew up, and we were just lucky enough to be there. Favorite food? Sushi. Dogs, cats, neither, or both? Dogs, 100%. Nickname growing up or in college? My mom called me and still calls me Toby. <laughs> but otherwise, no nickname. So only my mom's had a nickname. My brother was Tyler, Tyler so it was Toby Tyler. There was a book called Toby Tyler. What's one unusual fact that few people know about you? Um, most people don't know that I'm the oldest of eight, probably. Unless they know me. It's not all that unusual, but somewhat more unusual these days than it was 20 years ago. You're a reader? Big reader. What are your favorite one to three books not titled the Holy Bible? <laughs> um, so my probably my all-time favorite was Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. Read it over and over. I always loved Catcher in the Rye. Mm. I was an English major and just always loved that book from high school and college and on. So those are two biggies. And then probably Tipping Point in recent years. Um, Tipping Point or any of the books by Seth Godin. I love Seth Godin. He's very short and to the point. You know, he's considered kind of the father of digital marketing. And so I love him for that. Uh, I love Tipping Point for just talking about, you know, using data to look at trends and how technology influences us. And then, you know, non or fiction, like Catcher in the Rye. Have you or someone you deeply trust ever experienced something extremely unusual? Could be something unexplainable. Could be something spiritual. Yeah. UFOs are in the news. Yeah. I feel like I experience something unusual every day before noon but when you give me the example so the one thing that comes to mind it was a big one for our family was I have a, uh, seven younger brothers and sisters the brother under me is uh, less than 12 months younger than me and so we were very close growing up and when we were uh, young adults he ended up uh, getting diagnosed with a brain aneurysm uh, it was Whoa. very complex life threatening he was living in Denver I was in LA at the time and so they did not give him a, a significant prognosis to live, 5%. Um, so through friends, my parents were able to get him uh, transferred to UCLA, mm. where one of the top guys in the world uh, was, was operating. And so that was great because I was there. My sister came out, who's a nurse, and was his 24-hour nurse. And that ended up saving his life as well. Wow. Um, because all kinds of mistakes were made in the, in the ward just crap that you just don't even realize goes on mistakes that you know would have been made and killed him but you know our family has strong faith people were praying for him all over the world and uh, I remember you know here he is a young man at 23 years old or something had to sign documentation saying he did not expect to come out of that surgery and it was one of those surgeries if you've ever seen he probably you know people probably seen this in, on the on a TV show where there's, it's like an arena, you know, the, the, there's a series of seating up above and they watch the, the surgery take place. And so they had 
they had physicians and industry, medical device industry people from all over the world coming in to watch the surgery because of how complex it was. And it was very unique at the time. So, you know, it was unnerving to have your brother wheeled into something like that and not expecting that he's going to come out alive. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was a circus. This physician was a rock star. I mean, he had, as he walked through the hospital, 20, 30 people following him, you know, as you would expect a rock star. So, but we had, you know, we had confidence that he was in the Lord's hand. And um, needless to say, he came out successfully. Now, that said, it was even more complex. So they went in for the first surgery and an hour later, the physician came out and they had backed out of the surgery, said it didn't work, but he's too weak to operate again. And so that physician who was considered the top in the world had to go off to a conference in Europe. And so he wasn't available to do the surgery for a number of weeks. And so his number two was going to step in and do it. And Part of our confidence was in the fact that the number one guy in the world was doing this. And now it was going to be the protege, and the protege had never done a surgery on his own. This was going to be his first solo surgery. Mm. So my brother was a little rocked by that. So they gave him, you know, I can't remember, it was three, four, five days to recover. Then they were going to go in and attempt the surgery again. And that surgeon, because this was his his moment, he moved into the hospital that week. He stayed there 24-7. And so... In retrospect, that was a blessing mm-hmm. because, you know, for the other guy, this was routine. Routine For this guy, it was his show. This was his movement into the major leagues, and uh, he nailed it. Wow. So, and to this day, my brother's thriving and, and, and alive and mm. shouldn't have been. Name three things you're thankful for at this point in your life. You know, my kids, number one, extremely thankful for my kids. I have three great kids. 16, 14, and 11. Uh, Very thankful for my broader family. Like I mentioned, got a huge family, extended family, and they're all terrific, very different. Uh, So extremely thankful for for all of them. And and then I'm thankful for my network of friends. I've been very blessed to have an incredible group of friends through church and just the broader community. So it really comes down to people, all of them. Hmm. You could be any animal. What would you be? Uh, I like that lion on the wall. I'd probably be a lion, but otherwise, I'd be a Rottweiler. <laughs> Early riser, night owl, normal. Both. I loved. I love both. I was in the military, and you know, love to get up before the enemy. Um, so I like like to get up at four, but there are days when I like to go to bed at one. If you could live anywhere, where would that be? Either Santa Barbara, California, or Zurich, Switzerland. Ooh. And Zurich, Switzerland is the city that is most like Seattle, Washington, where I lived. And I love the water, and I love... It's a very smart group of people. Zurich, people in Zurich are very smart. It's beautiful. you got the mountains. you got the Swiss Alps. Um, great food. It's the center of Europe, so you can be anywhere in a couple of hours. Um, but Santa Barbara, it's, it's, uh, I'm pretty sure Garden of Eden was Santa Barbara. <laughs> what's your greatest strength and what's your greatest weakness? My greatest strength might be my ability to communicate ideas. And my greatest weakness might be my ability to cr- communicate ideas. Oh, so. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. My, my greatest weakness is probably not being empathetic to understanding why people don't understand certain ideas. I might have a vision for something and, and, and don't often have an appreciation why everybody hasn't gotten on that train yet. So, lack of empathy. Who's been the greatest influence in your life? Uh, my dad, mm. for sure. Talk about him. He's a very humble guy. He's a very godly man, uh, 100% committed to his kids, you know, and grandkids. He's 80 years old, he and my mom both, and they grew up together. You know, he's been devoted in serving my mom his entire life, so he sets a great example there. And to this day, you know, at 80 years old, we should be serving him, but not a day goes by where he's not running ragged to 
get grandkids someplace or solve some problem or going to help my sister on her farm in Wisconsin or whatever. Mm. It's like, I don't think he'll stop until the day he dies. Mm. So he's, he's just always serving everybody else. Who's the first person you think of when you hear the word successful? I think of, because I was just thinking of them this morning, the Green family, David Green in particular. The Green family are the family behind Hobby Lobby. Mm-hmm. And uh, they're wildly successful, but they understand where that success comes from. And they understand that that success, in their particular case, financial success, doesn't always have to be financial, but in this particular case it is, is not so that they can have multiple yachts and cars and homes. It's so that they can serve and bless other people. And so to me, they are the quintessential definition of success. Of success. Mm. When you feel overwhelmed or you've lost your focus, what do you do? I find some place to be by myself and think and read just contemplate and slow down regroup but I've learned over the years particularly the last five years to you know it's easy to say be anxious for nothing but in all things through prayer and supplication give your make your request be known to God it's easy to to read the words of you know, yesterday's troubles are gone. Tomorrow hasn't arrived. Worry about all that sounds really nice and pithy, but it's different and difficult to put into practice. How do you sleep at night knowing, you know, this or that's going on? And I've had some some real trials in the last five years. I mean, some serious challenges, one of which was an SEC investigation. Whoa. Yeah, heavy stuff. You know, the day you get get served a subpoena, three subpoenas to your fund and to your company and your attorneys are telling you this is a multi-year, multi-million dollar process. Ooh. It's daunting. Um, and it forced me to say to the Lord, this is your, it's in your hands. You, mm. know, you just take one day at a time. And two, day, two years later, two and a half years later, I get a call from the SEC essentially saying, You've been one of the best groups to work with. You guys have been transparent. We're sorry we had to put you through this. It's just our job. And in fact, we're we're, hap- we're so happy with the outcome. We'd be happy to give you some offline advice on how to do some other things going forward. We can never put this on the record. Wow. And so wow. Lord blessed us through that, carried wow. us through that. But it taught me how to truly... Put stuff at his feet and trust him. How do you want to be remembered? I want to remember it as somebody who helped other people succeed and get better and and reach their potential. Mm. A coach. Mm. I look in football at Bill Walsh. is one of my, I don't say idol, but somebody I look up to. It's not because he won a bunch of Super Bowls. It's because when you look at Bill Walsh and the assistants that came through his system and went on to become head coaches in the NFL, they dominated the NFL. And so Bill Walsh's legacy is not his Super Bowls, in my opinion. It's the people that he helped to reach their potential and the impact that they had. So I'd like to have similar kinds of impact through other people. That I'm not the story. They're the story. Final three questions. What does Holy Smokes mean to you? And how has it contributed to your spiritual journey? Um, I've, you know, I've come to value community and connectivity. We've talked about that a little bit, Vertigo Club and other places. I've been building communities online. And so I love uh, the combination of guys that enjoy cigars, love cigars, and love Jesus. And that's a powerful combo of just an opportunity to connect with guys that have that that common faith and, and an interest in having smoke. So um, I've just started to, to enjoy that access to that community. If you could have a holy smoke with any three people throughout history, living or deceased, who would they be? Can't name Jesus. 
Can I be Jesus? <laughs> um, you mentioned this the other day. So if I went way, way back, I'd say Solomon. Ooh, I like him. Don't know that he had cigars, but he probably had something equivalent, whatever it was at the time. And, uh, you know, pre-800 wives. So before he got all jacked up by all those women, uh, it would have been fun to hang out with him. Ask him which books got chopped off the off the book of Proverbs. Like, a, what, what didn't make Proverbs? What was one you wish got in there? He would have been interesting. Fast forward, for sure, Winston Churchill. Um, I mentioned I worked for Reagan, but Churchill was the British version of Reagan. And um, so he would have been classic, and, and obviously he liked cigars. And then more recently, I was trying to think of who would be somebody that was a little bit more recent. And you know what? I'd probably say, because he's just a character and he's wicked smart, be fun to have a cigar with Elon Musk. But you're right up there with all three, my man. <laughs> <laughs> Last question. All right. If we're to meet one year from today, and I get that coffee flown in from Boston that you mentioned, what was the name of that one? George Howell. George Howell. Yeah. What are we celebrating? There will be a lot to celebrate between now and next year. But one thing, amongst others, will be that Innovation for Alpha will have concluded a thriving first year and will be moving into phase two of its evolution in which we will have raised or be in the process of raising our first fund and beginning to buy and invest in companies and executing the services that we're building now into those companies. And so that'll be a, a good first year milestone point for innovation for Alpha. And it's gonna lead into some really fun companies that are in store. So we'll be celebrating that next year. Tobin Arthur. Thanks for being on the Holy Smokes podcast, my man. Anytime, Steve. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs>